Okay, so um, looking forward to this paper very much. And it's my pleasure to introduce Julia, or Julia Winkler. She's an academic, a photographer, a very good photographer, and principal lecturer in the School of Art and Media, University of Brighton. She has exhibited and published widely on memory and migration narratives, contested topographies, exile, and loss. Also, she has published extensively, as I might have mentioned yesterday, on Wolczyszynski. I think she was the first person to really do so. Uh, and she, just one example of an article uh, that she's written, uh, is included in one of the research centers yearbook, the one on the apply. Looking forward very much to this talk about a particular book. Over to you. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you for saying I'm, I'm the first to write on Wolczyszewski. That's, that's very generous, but not quite true. I need to also pay tribute to people like Duncan Forbes and Ilmi Schabe, who um, also wrote about the importance of Wolczyszewski's work. But I'm certainly, I've certainly been very interested in Wolf's work um, about children and his children's books in particular. So in my presentation today, um, I will focus on just just one publication that Wolczyszewski co-produced um, with the psychologist Lisa Lotte Frankel. Um, and I will, I will concentrate on, on uh, this particular publication. Um, in 1946, That Baby, an educational children's picture book, was published by Collins. The publication marks an innovative approach, both in the design, content, photography, and in its understanding of children's needs. It was designed and produced by Adprint to a very high standard. The book is remarkable for the 24 color photographs that enrich the text. These were taken by the renowned emigre photographer and cameraman, Wolf Sashitsky. Sashitsky grew up in Vienna and emigrated to London in 1935, aged just 23, where he would work in photography and film over a period of seven decades. When Sashitsky died five years ago, at the age of 104, he left a huge and important visual legacy. He would receive further commissions to work on notable children's book series and also made documentary films, including for the Ministry of Education. The book, That Baby, also deserves renewed attention due to its child-centered focus and message, which owe much to the fact that the text was written by the Venice child psychologist, Dr. Lisa Lotte Frankel, who emigrated to England aged 28 in 1938. The book's narrative reflects Frankel's training in child psychology and her ability to th think through the uncertainties of childhood in a sympathetic and educational way. In this presentation, I consider the book's production context in conjunction with Sashitsky's interest in documentary realism and Frankel's developmental child psychology. Frankel received a PhD in psychology in Vienna in 1935 for a study that discussed the merits and pitfalls of the use of reward and punishment as tools in child and adolescent education. She studied and then worked with Professor Charlotte Bühler, who at the time was the only professor of child development in Europe. Frankel first met Anna Freud in 1936, when she began to attend Freud's child analysis lectures at the Lehrinstitut der Wiener Psychoanalytischen Vereinigung. Frankel would later become a children's analyst herself, with interests ranging from initial assessments to developmental psychology. She initially worked in Scotland, but later would work closely with Anna Freud and Freud's partner, Dorothy Burlingham, who also emigrated from Vienna in 1938. No doubt that baby's sensitive, empathetic narrative was influenced by the fact that the photographs had been made in the Hampstead Nursery, set up by Freud and Burlingham. Those of you who attended Mikhail Shapira's talk yesterday will have already heard about the important role that the Hampstead War Nursery played during World War II, especially in offering support to children and in, in studying their emotional responses. In the opening pages of that baby, and you can see this on the slide here, Freud, Burlingham, and the members of staff at the Hempstead Nursery are thanked especially for having 
given permission to take photographs at the nursery and for their cooperation and assistance. Some of the photographs used in the Adprint publication therefore provide rare insights into the nursery and include the children's play area and some of the children's toys. Freud and Birmingham set up the Hampstead war nurseries in 1940 in order to respond to the needs of traumatized young children and would later also take in some child refugees. There was a nursery for infants and a second nursery that looked after children up to the age of 10. In his 1980 doctoral thesis and in his 1983 book on Anna Freud's work, Raymond Dwyer writes that Lisa Lotte Frankel also supported the work of the Hampstead War Nursery, for example, by sorting children's clothes and helping with preparations, but however, was not a staff member there. Dwyer writes that the nurseries paid close attention to giving the children in their care access to sunlight and fresh air, and that the nurseries were inspired also by the work of Maria Montessori. An in-depth discussion of the complex work that took place at the Hampstead War Nurseries can be found in Michael Shapiro's book, The War Inside. Shapiro writes that by the end of 1941, the nurseries provided refuge to over 100 children whose families had either lost their homes during the Blitz or who needed temporary support because either one or both parents were supporting the war effort through active service. And here's a, a quote from uh, Shapira's book. Despite the psychological nursing of the children, the staff was remarkably resourceful during the war in taking care of material and physical needs. They made new toys and, re and repaired the existing equipment. Lisa Lotte Frankel would eventually become medical director of the Hampstead Child Therapy Clinic, which succeeded the Hampstead War Nursery and worked at the clinic for many years into the 1970s. The Freud Museum archive holds some of Anna Freud and Lisa Lotte Frankel's correspondence, and amongst the Anna Freud papers held at the Library of Congress, there are two correspondence folders spanning the years 1946 to 1982, right up to Anna Freud's death. The genesis of Adprint, which produced uh, the book that I'm talking about today, has been documented in great detail by Anna Nyberg in her book, Emigres, The Transformation of Art Publishing in Britain. Anna Nyberg discusses Adprint's foundation by the Viennese publisher and emigre Wolfgang Forges, who decided to specialize in color printing. Forges was supported by Walter Neurath, a fellow Viennese emigre, who was responsible for book designs. And in her book, Nyberg writes that Adprint contained many photographs. The director of photography, Paul Rother, made heavy use of refugee photographers, including Wolstoszewski and his sister, Edith Tudorhardt, Bill Brandt and Zoltan Wegner. After the war, the successful photographic theme was continued, in particular in children's books. The clarity and appeal of the color photographs continued to be a selling point of the books until Adprint's demise in the late 1940s. The impact was striking, and one writer noted the continental sense of design. Wolstoszewski's sister, Edith, had trained as a kindergarten teacher and photographer, and she also documented children's physical and developmental educa education for publications such as Moving and Growing. It would have been equally fitting to highlight her photographic and socialist vision and contributions to photography in this talk, but there isn't enough time in this presentation to do this. Here's one example of another children's book produced by Adprint, the 1945 story, The Seven Ravens, created by three other Austrian emigres. Grimm's fairy tale was translated and adapted for young British readers by Lisbeth Gombrich, the sister of art historian Ernst Gombrich. The dolls were made by Amalia Serkin and photographer Zoltan Wegner, who was also a close friend of Wolstoszewski, took all the photographs. This was one of two Adprint collaborations between Wegener, Gombrich, and Serkin. When speaking with Wolstoszewski in 2015, he explained that Adprint had created some of the first color photo photography books for children. He recalls that, along with Zoltan Wegener, I was one of the photographers because they had seen some of my photographs of children. Mainly, Soschitsky's work was in black and white. This is one of the few examples of his color work. Soschitsky's contributions to Earth Prince Children's Book Series also included an illustrated book on the alphabet. Color film, as you 
people know, in the 1940s were still quite rare and also very expensive. So Shitsky explained that to use the camera with half transparent mirrors that could make three different color negatives at the same time that could then be combined to produce beautiful colored prints that would also print well when published. The color photographs add to the documentary realist style of the whole book. Although the narrative is of course entirely constructed and the story enacted, the mixture of indoor and outdoor scenes in the photographs, which, have been, which were taken across various locations in London, reveal the social realist as well as humanist sensitivities of the photographer. The book's storyline focuses on a young boy, three-year-old Peter, who lives with his parents, his Aunt Margaret, and the family cat Bessie. His parents are expecting their second child. I will slowly now take you through the slides and let you absorb some of the story. It is interesting to note that although the book came out in 1946, there is no mention at all of the recent war. The story focuses on young children's developmental milestones as well as their emotional needs. Each double page spread follows the same formula of short text on the left side juxtaposed with a large corresponding photograph on the right side. The language and choice of words are very accessible and pitched at young children. Frankel used the format of short, easy to follow dialogues between the book's protagonists, as can be seen in this double spread of the only interaction shown between Peter and his father. The book's photographic viewpoints, visual perspectives and angles in the main mirrored those of children. Rather than looking down at the protagonist and acting the plot or creating distance between reader and subjects through the use of a wide angle lens, Sushitsky predominantly employed close up frames and also made photographs from the height of children. Readers could feel that they were part of the story. Bessie the cat and her kittens are used as an example to teach Peter, who is worried that his mother may stop liking him once the second child arrives, that mothers can like all of their children, they're able to look after them all. The book follows the family story over the course of just over one year, leading up to the first birthday of Peter's little brother Stephen. Readers see Peter as he's initially confused, then struggles and eventually adjusts to the arrival of a baby brother. Educational and psychological experiences are explored in Peter's own life, as well as in that of the new baby. The book illustrates particular feelings, and in this scene, Peter is encouraged to help his mother. The narrative addresses a range of conflicting and confusing emotions such as jealousy, excitement, envy, defiance, aggression, anxiety, sibling rivalry, but also love. As soon as Stephen is born, Peter is understandably curious about this new brother and hopes to be able to play with this little person instantly. In the story, he puts his favorite toy, a heavy wooden engine, on top of the tiny baby and of course gets told off by his mother, who gently explains that Stephen will still needs a lot of care and is too small to do anything for himself. Peter also starts mirroring his little brother's behavior, regressing to an earlier developmental stage, for example, by putting his finger in his mouth just like his little brother. When his mother tells him off gently, Peter gets annoyed and is pictured painting in the nursery and then smearing paint all over his face, arms and leg legs in an act of defiance. But his mother understands and is not angry with him. Instead, she makes time and involves Peter in helping bathe the baby together so that Peter learns to share his mother's attention while also enjoying the company. Scenes in, the book, scenes in the book also feature people admiring the new baby and more or less ignoring Peter's presence. The story emphasizes the importance of maternal care and to make Peter feel special again, his mother takes him out into London for an afternoon. They're pictured going on a bus ride, on a shopping trip and even for afternoon tea, where Peter's allowed to have real tea in his milk and select his favorite cakes. In addition to focusing on mother, child and sibling relationships, the book also conveys to readers in subtle ways that making a mess while eating, even when sitting at the dining table with everyone else, is all part of a young child's development. A key message of the book is that children need to be involved in making decisions early on, from Peter being allowed to choose flowers at a stall for Stephen's first birthday, to helping his mother bake a birthday cake, to which Peter's also allowed to invite some of his friends. 
At the party, Peter cuts his brother's cake for him and blows out his birthday candle. Note also in this photograph the child-appropriate furniture. Peter is encouraged to help his brother understand how to do things together by modeling cooperative behavior. As well as highlighting the strong bond between a mother and her children, the story concludes with a budding friendship between the two siblings and Peter learning to become sensitive to the needs and growing abilities of his little brother as they enjoy playing together. Frankel's text functioned on several levels. It could be read as a comforting bedtime story to young children, it worked as a standalone picture book and could also help build children's literacy skills. Reflecting on this book, half a century later, Wolstoschitzky recalled that the book had also been, quote, found to be very useful by parents who wanted to introduce the problem of a new sibling to their young son or daughter, end of quote. I contacted special collections at Reading University as they hold some of Adwin's book correspondence, but sadly the collection holds nothing on this publication, and we don't yet know the real names of the boys who played Peter and Stephen. In some of Sashitsky's work, he included photographs of his own children and a portrait of his, sister's, uh, of his sister Edith's son Tommy, um, I'm not sure if you can see it here, I'm holding up the book, made the cover of his 1940 photography manual on how to photograph children. I checked in with Wolstoschitzky's family, and although his own son was also called Peter, born in 1941, and his second son, Misha, was born in the mid-1940s, the family confirmed that the children featured in this story were not related to the photographer. My research to date has not been able to unearth examples of any further collaborations between Frankel and Sushitsky. While there is much information and literature on Anna Freud and Dorothy Burlingham's legacy, there's still relatively little information available on Lieselotte Frankel, and I think more work could be done to highlight her contributions. It is, of course, reasonable to say that some aspects of the publication that baby are now very dated, especially the gender roles. The portrait family is white, middle class, heterosexual, and conforms to very traditional gender roles. The father doesn't seem to play any significant parental role in the story, and the mother is seen to do all of the housework and all of the caring. But other aspects of the book's narrative, I feel, still hold up well today. These include the focus on children's developmental needs, nurturing emotional bonds, and allowing children to thrive. In an essay published in 2014, four child clinicians considered the legacy of Anna Freud's work in relation to their work at the National Association for the Education of Young Children. They write that child-focused practices were a hallmark at the Hampstead Clinic. Anna Freud believed there were three things necessary to ensure child-focused practices. These included, quote, quote within a quote, the free interchange of affection between child and adult, an ample external stimulation of the child's inborn internal potentialities, and an unbroken bond continuity of care. These mirror, as they go on to say, some of the statements made by the Division of Early Childhood Recommended Practices, and I would say they also mirror what we see in the publication. Both Wolstoschitzky and Lisa Lotte Frankel continued throughout their careers to promote the agency and autonomy of children. At the age of 102, I recorded Wolstoschitzky discussing his work. So I would now like to conclude, I hope this will work. Um, just need to exit this briefly and switch over to another screen. Um, I would now like to conclude by just showing you a one-minute extract of a video clip where Wolf himself in 2015 talks about the ad print publication and uh, his photographs of children. So I will hopefully just go to uh, full screen. Your, your particular interest in photographing children and filming children. I always liked children, especially babies. If you look at the hands and the toes of babies, they're so pretty and almost fully formed for the future. Will children are the future of any country. And uh, to see them learning 
by watching them roaming around in a room and twisting all the buttons they find. And they really want to learn about their surroundings and do a lot of research, as it were. It was very useful to them. Very often, grown-ups converse with each other and neglect children. They are not treated as persons, but as a nuisance <laughs> most of the time. And it's important to give children some confidence in their existence. I had done some children's book before this, mm -hmm. books for children. There was a company called Adprint mm -hmm. who made some of the first color photographed books mm -hmm. for children. Mm -hmm. And I had done one on animals before this, mm -hmm. I believe. Okay, I just wanted to finish the presentation with Will's own words. Thank you very much. Um, oh yeah, I, I could have seen a lot more of that. I would have, I would have loved that. Fascinating, and of course the whole, the whole for me, particular interest in ad print, which wasn't a publisher. They weren't a publisher. They were a book packaging company, but it was pretty much, uh, they were pretty much all Austrian emigres who worked there. Um, doing modern book design and and illustration and bringing it that it was the design that was so wonderful, wasn't it? And integrating the photographs, and uh, yeah, and, and Wolf was part of that part of that picture. Anyway, <clears throat> thank you very much. A lot to think about. Oh. Viennese now because our next speaker is Professor Rolf Laven. Now he is an artist, um, he's active in sculpture, installation and painting, and he lectures and researches at the Pädagogische Hochschule Wien, the Vienna. Um, he's also at the Academy of Fine Arts and the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. But he was born in Germany, uh, where he studied sculpture and art education. Uh, he did an MA in Viennese kineticism and his PhD dissertation in 2004 was the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna and his thesis was Franz Cicek, um, which you'll hear no doubt the um, definitive pronunciation properly. I apologize if I haven't said it correctly. Franz Cicek and the reputation of the Viennese juvenile art class. Um, so that ties in obviously with today's talk. But since 1992, he's been internationally involved in art education, exhibitions, symposia, and research alliances, um, including kineticism, musical graphics, and Chitek research. And I noticed at the end of the film, something called um, Slusic Service Learning Upscaling Social Inclusion for Kids. So it sounds to me as though there's a, a sort of practice and so I'm in keeping with Chisek and, and Red Vienna there too. So uh, over to you, Ralph, Rolf, and um, ready to go. Thank you very much. Annie, I, don't, I didn't hear everything in the end because there were some interruptions, but thank you very much in every case. Yeah, you were talking about my dissertation about Franz Zizek and the juvenile Viennese art class, uh, and I try to show you some pictures, some images about this case, and I think it's a big, big uh, um, problem to show it all. Therefore, I will start continuing. You see here the image, the, the, the book cover of my dissertation. I wrote it in 2006. I did a big, big mistake. I wrote it in German and not in English. Therefore, uh, it would have been better to, to do it in English, but I got the chance uh, half a year ago to translate this book into English. And I did a kind of comic, a kind of graphic novel about the Zizek stuff. So I put all the 500 pages into eight pages. It was uh, a possibility to do it at the Concordia University uh, in Montreal. A colleague of mine, uh, Anita Sinner and Dustin Garnett, they 
they, 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 they produced a big encyclopedia about the art history, art education history, and they wanted the Zizek to be in this book, in this, you know, academic book. And I think it is a big fun to put Zizek in a kind of comic into this book. Um, yeah, Franz Zizek, pioneer of child art education and his influence of, in the UK. I tried to overall picture of Zizek's work and impact against the background of contemporary pedagogical positions based on a largely unpublished material in the Zizek archives in Vienna and interviews with eyewitnesses and promoters of, of, the, of his artistic approach. The history of Zizek's influence is traced in interviews with contemporary witnesses and former students and documents the importance and his teaching and his school in Great Britain, among others for Kingsley Doubleday, for Rosalind Eckert, Basil Rock, Marian Richardson, R. R. Tomlinson, but also to Austrian emigrants such as Margarete Hammerschlag Berger, Mary Pennett, born Foot, we heard yesterday about her, and Hilda Ascher. Uh, Franz Zischek is seen as an outstanding visionary reformator of art education, according to Herbert Reed. He is the father of art education. His Viennese juvenile art classes, Wiener Jugendkunstklasse, which he found in 1897 in close contact with the secession, with the secession, became a crystallization point and a mediation center of an internationally effective reform movement. The appreciation and the cultivation of a child's creative power, which was able to unfold in a supportive environment full of enthusiasm and joy of a creation, overwhelmed the authoritarian, the authoritarian regulatory and the standardizing concepts of traditional education. Zizek's practical artistic and art pedagogical work with children and youth, and especially his very successful exhibition tour in Great Britain and North America, have been seen as a groundbreaking, has seen as a groundbreaking and handed down to the present day by reform movements worldwide, especially to Herbert Reed's child art movement. The Oxford Dictionary of 20 20th century art devotes a whole page on the Austrian Franz Zizek. Zizek born 1865, died 46, Austrian painter and teacher, key figure in history of children's art education, found a school called Kinderkunstklasse for children at the age of three upwards. Um, he, his ideas became well known through lectures. He spoke at educational conferences in London in 1908 and at Dresden in 1912 on two exhibitions of the work of his pupils, which tours in whole Europe, in England, and in the USA, which helped to popularize linocut as a special technique suited for children. And his work also helped to bring child art to the attention of avant-garde artists. Now I wanted to step over to Bertram Hauer and Francesca M. Wilson and the Save the Children Fund. The political crisis and the First World War endangered the continued existence of the juvenile art class, which had already had to manage on an extremely small budget since its foundation. Its international, international form faded and the working conditions in the experimental class deteriorated drastically. A student of Zizek, Franz Victor Vadrus Jr. recalled, worse, worse than the war was 1918-19. There was simply nothing. It was a bleak. Also Ilse Bright, another Zizek pupil, reports retro retrospectively, the years of the upheaving were also very difficult for us. There were almost no colors left in the classes. The papers on which we painted became smaller and smaller. Professor Zizek and we children were very depressed because every moment we were told our class is being closed down. There was no more money to maintain it. 
the depressing living situation of the Viennese and the insecure status of the children's art class led to numerous Anglo-American relief remissions. Among the supporters were the Society of France, the France Relief Mission, the Hoover Plan, and the International Red Cross, Cross and the Save the Children Fund. A quote from Zizek, then really at the last moment came help. An Englishman who visited our class gave a rich donation and collected more money for us in his home country. We all breathed a sign of relief. New material was bought and the class started working again with enthusiasm. After some time, an exhibition of the class works was sent to England and traveled through many cities. From then on, Professor Zizek became well known and famous all over the world. This Englishman was Bertram Horror, who after the First World War together with Francesca M. Wilson organized relief for Elling Relief for Elling um, Austria on behalf of the British Quakers. Francesca Wilson spent a long time in the youth art class and she describes her impressions in a book about her interval relief, relief work in the margins of chaos. She describes Vienna as a dead city without food or fuel the graveyard of a once glorious metropole, a huge mausoleum. Its wounds were hidden. This was how a great empire ends, not with a bang, not even it seemed with a whimper. Nothing here was but hunger, cold, and hopelessness. Francesca Wilson also found well-being in the joy of the children's drawings. Uh, a time when her work in the working area was marked by sorrow and hardship. In her memories, published in a quarter of a century after her time in Vienna, the Save the Children Found affiliated humanitarian wrote of the students of the Zizek workshops that this contact with youth added a special glow to me, to my Vienna days. So even now, when I think of them, I do not think of hunger and relief work, but of the laughter and the gaiety and of the gifted children. And was very impressed of the cheerful atmosphere in the youth art class amidst the day-to-day -day misery of the city. Wilson maintained close contact with Fischek and published notes on her visits and conversation in her book, Child as, The Child as an Artist, Some Conservation, Conversation with Franz Zizek, a lecture by Franz Zizek, a class at Professor Zizek in 1921. Uh, despite the chronic financial problems of the youth art class described in the beginning of the article, its reputation grow. Thus, in 1990, 20, 1990, 20, on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the Kunstgewerbeschule, uh, the exhibition Kind and Kunst. Child and Art was held in the Lichtenstein Garden Palais, a very expensive, extensive exhibition with numerous lectures for the Viennese working class. When Bertram Hocker saw this exhibition, he stated, now a quote, Austria has saved nothing from the war except the talent of its children. And if it were to let this go to waste, Austria would give itself up. This nurturing place should not be allowed to perish because that would be not only be a loss for Austria, but a loss for the whole of the culture. He recognized the enormous potential of the children's work and suggested to be shown in a traveling exhibition tour in his country. So from 1920 on, onwards, an exhibition shown in the Palais Liechtenstein was presented to the organization skills of Horror and Hocker and Wilson uh, for four years in the British island in the most important cities. Uh, Zizek's relationship with England was already very effective and consistent throughout his long career as an art educator and had repercussions on his uh, domestic reputation. 
The, the newspaper reports of this exhibition in Britain are probably some of the finest ever written about uh, children's art. Now I want to quote one of these articles in 1920 till 24, this exhibition took place in about 80 Great Britain cities with numerous lectures given by professors from the University of London, Oxford, Cambridge, Glasgow, and many other cities. Even the Archbishop of Canterbury paid tribute from the pulpit to the psychogenic creations of these Viennese children. Uh, the royal family was very impressed and delighted. The book, Child Art and Franz Zizek, I have to go on. This was the exhibition, that was the tour. Uh, the book, Child Art and Franz Zizek, which His Majesty has gradually deigned to accept Queen Mary is delighted with it. The book mentioned above was Wilhelm Viola's Child Art and Franz Zizek with the German translation supplement Kinderkunst und Franz Zizek. As Secretary General of the Austrian Youth Red Cross, active from 1922 till 38, Viola was certainly Zizek's most energetic Austrian promoter. Under his leadership, the young Red Cross published a magazine, 10 issues per year from April 1922 onwards, in which the work of the Zizek School was consistently highlighted and gained worldwide recognition. Hocker believed if we could tour on an exhibition in his children's work in England, raise money for Vienna and revolutionize art education system in Britain, it would work and it really worked. They organized an exhibition in London of drawings and then printings uh, done by the Viennese people aged eight to 15. At the same time, saw the production of, sold the productions of postcards, posters and brochures to accompany the exhibition tour. This tour, this exhibition tour was a remarkable milestone in the narrative of exhibiting children's artwork in art galleries. The catalog, The Child as Artist, some conservation with Franz Zizek combined Wilson's text with reproduction of the wood and linum carvings. I just want to mention this, this linum carvings was really invention of Zizek. He was the first one who used lino cut and lino printing in, in the school system. The attitude continues to enlighten many users of the artworks today from their maintains in an artistic institution as the Lawrence Batley archive. I just searching for the right. No, I lost it. Sorry. In the Lawrence Batley archive in the Yorkshire Sculpture Park uh, in Northern England to their reproduction in the writings and of associated humanitarian historians. The dissemination of children's paintings in the context of public spirited reconstructions, fundraising and the promotion of universal standards was and is thus an integral part of the development and dissemination of the idea of children's, children's artworks as an artistic expression that deserves attention. The notion, of the, imp the notion of the impartial look of innocent children free from the influence of the teachers reinforced this perception of the impartiality of humanitarian workers, which was devices dev decisive to fundraise. In November 24 issue, it was reported, the American Youth Red Cross magazine really Read by millions of children, devotes two pages of the October 24 issue of Professor Zizek's Youth Club. Thanks to the donations of this young Red Cross uh, humanitarian help, attendance of the youth artists was free for charge at that time. The working materials were also still provided to the pupils free of charge. Children from families with few financial means were to be able to take part in the classes a cross section of all social classes was desired and so all realized. Zizek quoted in this, in this connection that the Americans were always very disappointed when they visited 
the class. Um, they always think they will find a school here with 100 teachers, halls, and workshops. A school brilliantly subsidized by the state, excellently equipped from public funds, and then they see the single room in a complete ignored, completely ignored by the state, where all the teaching materials are raised through collections, where I have to pay myself for the teachers I employ here, where the state only has the grace to make a room available, one room. The moment those funds fail, the class will stop in its own accord. So, as I showed, this tour went also from 1925 to 27 to all big cities in the States, starting in the Metropolitan Museum of New York, went the whole East Coast to the West Coast, and in the end, it, it, you see here in, in, in California, in the San Diego Balboa Park, and ended up in 1927 in the uh, Gallery of Toronto, Canada. One of the most uh, wanted painting was this, made up Primavesi's work, uh, the wedding of Prim Primavesi. They wanted, the Americans wanted to buy the whole collection of this, of this tour, but uh, Zizek never ever sold any of this, uh, of the pictures and the images of the kids. Only once he made the acceptance because he gave as a gift 100 of the drawings and paintings to Francesca M. Wilson. And this collection is now in Yorkshire in the Lawrence Bradley archive. Uh, and uh, that's the only collection of Zizek outside from Vienna. If you ask me what, what's about the collection now in Vienna, the whole collection of the drawings and paint, paintings of the kids is now uh, archived in the Wien Museum, in the Vienna, the Historical Museum of Vienna, the Municipal Museum of Vienna. It's about 110,000 um, drawings and paintings and sculpture works. Uh, eight years from 2000 to 2008, I inventorized all these this, this paintings and drawings. It was a hard work I did, but it's still, it's a treasure and it's not, uh, it's under protection of the city of Vienna but it's not possible to see all these fantastic works. Now to Great Britain, as I told you, I wanted to show you some of, uh, uh, of the artists and students who were inspired by Zizek. One of them is Kingsley Doubleday. I have to do it now, I think a little bit quicker. He worked in London. He was a student from Zizek. And you see him here in his studio. He worked exactly with the same philosophy of Zizek in printing and painting and coloring, whatever. Another one is Marian Richardson and R.R. Tomlinson, two, uh, two uh, inspectors, two artists who also were very important for the child art movement. You see over there, there's a Marion. Richardson School, now a primary school in Vienna. Another very famous person is Margarete, Margareta Berger Hammerschlag, an Austrian refugee uh, who worked as an artist and at the same time as an art teacher in several clubs in London, mostly in the suburban areas. She worked so hard, I did some interviews with her son, that she died in 58 due to cancer, and he said she was working all the time so hard. In the day she worked as an art teacher, and the night as an artist, you always see the day has 24 hours, and uh, there was nothing left. Another one is Basil Rock, as an art teacher and teacher. He was well known. He was also one of the founder of the Eastern, Eastern Road School. He also made very interesting um, hospitation protocols of the Zizek class. He went to the Zizek class and later on he worked with Alec Gleick in, in, in Yorkshire. 
in the West Riding. Then another one, and the, the most important one is Herbert Reed, Education Through Art, the first edition, who is also influenced by Sisek. I want to show you in the end very quickly because I think I have not much time anymore. Friedel Dicker Brandt, as we talked yesterday about her, who died in 44 in Auschwitz. She was uh, an artist, designer, and she worked together with children in the concentration camp of Theresienstadt. She survived, she didn't survive, not a few persons survived, as you see here, Helga Pollack Kinsey. She unfortunately, she died last year. I got contact with her, made also some interviews with her. There was a big exhibition. Uh, Friedel Dicker Brandert was, was the teacher of Edith Kramer, the mother of art, of art therapy in Vienna, also an Austrian refugee who worked in the New York suburbs together with youth. She was influenced by Trude Hammerschlag, who worked together with Maria Montessori. Maria Montessori tried to get contact to Zizek. You see it in the letter above. He's writing a letter to Zizek. He wanted to, yeah, to get contact with him. Also very famous Siegfried Bernfeld, Sisyphus, and the Kinderheim Baumgarten in Vienna. You see uh, all these paintings and drawings from Zizek. They are also very emotional. Uh, yesterday we talked about, sorry, I was too quick here, about Marie Penneth and the kids of Windermere and Lydia Tischler. Then one, just to show this boy here sitting there, his name is Paul Peter Borges. He was also a refugee. He went to New York. This boy, Peter Borges, we went to the class. He visited, uh, 70 years later, he visited Vienna and he asked me if it's possible to make a workshop with kids in a primary school. And we did this workshop together with his wife, also a refugee, Lucy Borges. She was a fashion designer and he was a cartoon, a cartoonist for the Mad Magazine, for the New Yorker and so on. And she did this workshop. So you see there are a lot of stories. Erika Giovanna Klein worked in New York as an art teacher. Victor Löwenfeld was very important. Also Mark Rothko was, was, was uh, influenced by, by Zizek. He wrote it in his Cribble book. Joseph Boyce, Arthur Lisma and the group of seven in Toronto. He got an art class there in, in the tradition of Zizek. And this, the last picture I wanted to show, Francis Batiste, the son of uh, Indian, the uh, Indian camp of the chief. He was later the chief of this Indian camp. And he also got a painter and he sent these two paintings to Zizek to say thank you to Zizek because you know the situation in the school system in Canada in the thirties was very, very hard for the Indian people. Yeah, I visited two years ago, uh, the relatives of, of chief Baptiste and the person in the right is his granddaughter. She got also an artist and art educator. And this is Andrea Walsh, professor from Victoria. Um, she organized the exhibition of the paintings of the whole Indian camp they made in the schools. Yeah, in Vienna only left is just one place called Zizekplatz and his honorary grave at the Central Cemetery in Vienna for the rest, Sisek is totally forgotten. That's it. Thank you very much. I think I was a little bit too long, maybe. That's okay. No problem. Very rich and full presentation. Thank you, Rolf. Very good. Well, I make it exactly quarter past three, so it's now my pleasure to take over from Anna as uh, the chair of the proceedings. Um, we've just had a, a slight uh, technical hitch. Um, Deborah Jaffe, who was supposed to be presenting next, uh, has had problems with her computer, which she is desperately trying to sort out. So Rachel Dixon has very kindly decided, uh, agreed to go first, give um, Deborah a chance to do so. So uh, let me start by introducing 
Rachel, our next speaker. Uh, many of you will have come across her in one way or another. She was previously head of curatorial services at the Benuri Gallery and Museum here in London, and is now the consultant editor at the Benuri Research Unit, Buru, which focuses on the emigre contribution to visual culture in Britain since 1900. She's a committee member of the Research Centre for German and Austrian Exile Studies, uh, and she's spoken and written very extensively on the creative emigres in the UK and their contribution both to the fine and the applied arts. Her chapter on Elizabeth Tomalin, who was mentioned, if you recall, yesterday, but in her capacity as a, um, a pioneering textile designer, was uh, included in Exile and Gender, uh, Politics, Education and the Arts, the Research Centre's 2017 yearbook, and she's got chapters coming up forthcoming on the emigre contribution to music in the next Research Centre yearbook, and on second and third generation artists, mother and daughter Helga Mickey and Ruth Ricks, and I think Ruth is in the audience, I think, um, due for publication in 2022. And I can't resist adding, she also wrote a splendid chapter on the creative life of the British internment camps for the Insiders Outsiders Anthology, which I myself <laughs> co-edited, as indeed did uh, Anna Nyberg on the important uh, question of the emigre designer as one of the survey chapters. Lovely, so Rachel, over to you. I think everybody can see for themselves on the screen there what your topic is going to be. Right, lovely. Thank you, Monica, for the very kind introduction. Until earlier this year, Renata Meyer was a quiet, rather unsung presence in Benary's permanent collection of around 1500 works, represented by three charming drawings of young children, which she had donated and by archival items relating to her exhibition history with the gallery, spanning a quarter of a century. However, as I researched further for her entry in Bury's database of emigre artists and their contribution to British visual culture post-1900, I uncovered a fascinating narrative of a singular artistic life begun in Berlin, fashioned in exile, through which images of the child and childhood, real or imagined, vividly recur. I also discovered that Maya was not only a painter documenting infancy and childhood experiences in her South London locale, but a successful children's book illustrator, both accompanying texts by well-known English authors, such as Helen Cresswell, uh, as well as producing her own series of pioneering illustrated books, sometimes dramatically without words, utilizing unconventional printmaking techniques and published by the Bodley Head at the heart of which were her experiences of a refugee childhood, motherhood, and the lives of her own children. Furthermore, from the 1980s, she focused her practice to create a remarkable autobiographical frieze composed of textile and mixed media elements, accompanied by often lengthy stitched texts inspired by real life events and presented via a rich compendium of source images derived from magazines, newspapers, packaging, and other paper detritus of the time. Here was an emigre unintentionally using a pop art aesthetic to present her experience of migration and assimilation. And it's striking how quintessentially English are some of the source images to which I'll return later. But I'll begin with Maya's biography briefly. She was born into a comfortable middle-class Jewish family in Charlottenburg, Berlin in 1930, the daughter of Peter Meyer, a physician at the Charité Hospital, and his wife, Ava, née Tauber. Her paternal grandfather, also a doctor, fought for Germany in the First World War, winning an Iron Cross first class. Following the rise of Nazism, Meyer came to Britain with her immediate family in 1933 and after a very brief return to Germany on the grounds of her ill health to recuperate with her, her grandparents, um, following the family's first unsatisfactory accommodation in a damp Swiss cottage basement, Maya returned to England in 1934. Her father established a GP practice and they gained British citizenship in 1939. Maya spent most of the war years with her mother and brother. Her father as an army doctor was absent. After boarding school in Hemel Hempstead and evacuation to a very English family in the countryside, which caused some anxiety, Maya, much against her parents' wishes, studied art at Regent Street Polytechnic from 1947, now the University of Westminster. There she met Charles Keeping, five years her senior, 
from a working class London background who studied lithography, life drawing and anatomy and whom she married on the 20th of September 1952, despite having promised her parents that she would not fall in love with a penniless artist. Charles had been an apprentice printer aged 14, followed by war service in the Navy, as well as his career as a children's book illustrator, most notably illustrating the complete works of Dickens for the Folio Society. He taught lithography at Croydon College and at Camberwell School of Arts and Crafts. The couple shared a real enthusiasm for printmaking, each eventually having the luxury of their own secondhand printing press at home, bought cheaply, a critical influence on the development of the distinctive visual styles. In the late 1940s, Renata traveled to Palestine with her father to visit her, his sister, Ilza, a committed Zionist, at Kibbutz Beit Alpha. The communal kibbutz experience was particularly inspiring, convincing Maya to create the most extensive family unit when she returned to England. And this was achieved in 1960 when the couple bought a large rundown house with a big garden in Shortland, South London. Here, an extended family of five adults, seven children and a pony lived in a slightly unconventional but happy life. And this included the four keeping children born between 1953 and 62, Jonathan, Vicky, Sean, and Frank, the youngest, who was of Caribbean heritage and was adopted. Despite a very English marriage, Renata made links, maintained links to her Jewish identity, showing early on with ben -Uri. In its autumn 1951 exhibition, with over 130 exhibits and a high proportion of emigre artists, Maya showed her Spanish boy, while the 1952 summer exhibition, appropriately for this talk, in aid of the Jerusalem baby's home, featured the rabbi. The Jewish Chronicles review of the 1955 open show highlighted, quote, several interesting works by artists who are not yet so well known, including A Child in a Bath by Renata Meyer, end quote. And the catalogue lists a work entitled Jonathan, which as we know is the name of Meyer's son. While the AJR information observed, quote, the avowed aim of this exhibition was to encourage all artists without prejudice. The result was the appearance of a remarkable number of refugee artists, but also inevitably a mass of extremely varied work, end quote. Maya was again singled out for praise. In December 1955, Maya featured in the exhibition three young painters at Benuri with two contemporaries, Alfred Harris and Lawrence Markison. Of the exhibition, the Times noted, quote, her two largest canvases, Sardinian Sunday and Cowley Day Nursery Brixton, are both remarkable for their observant studies of children. A charming sense of humor saves this artist from sentimentality, end quote, while they AJR information under the heading ex-German Jews in the news, a young painter, declared that, quote, a fine success was scored by 25-year-old Berlin-born Renata Meyer, end quote. In June 57, Meyer showed at the Felix Gallery, recently opened in William Road in Camden Town, and described as, quote, ideal for first one-man shows by young artists. It is till today crowded by a jostling group of five. One of them is Renata Meyer, whose maternity hospital scene seems to fail in concentration as a painting, but whose two studies of babies are sensitive and complete in themselves, end quote. Conversely, artist and critic Stephen Bone, writing in the Manchester Guardian, described Meyer's painting of the antenatal ward of Beckenham Maternity Hospital as, quote, outstanding. Bone also singled out her pastel drawings of mothers with children, exhibited in October at the Walker Gallery, along with members of the Regent Street group, nine artists who studied together at the Poly. In November 1957, Myers Cowley Day Nursery featured in Young Artists of Promise, edited by Jack Beddington, himself from a Jewish background, who had been publicity manager for Shell, commissioning artists for its poster campaigns and introducing the famous catchphrase, that Shell that was. An art collector during the war, he'd also been director of films at the Ministry of Information. Following an open call for artists under 35, Beddington had selected 150 works by 120 artists from around 5,000 entries, 
and according to the Jewish Chronicle, was, quote, impressed by the general high level of craftsmanship. Also, that there were practically no cheerful pictures, except landscapes, a depressing, but I'm sure true comment on the younger artists of today, end quote. Maya was again praised for her admirable Cowley Day Nursery Brixton. Yet none of these reviews acknowledged the most striking aspect of the painting, that it depicted, and this is a quote from the Borough of Lambert's website, a black child asleep outdoors at the Cowley Day Nursery on the corner of Brixton Road and Vassal Road, a detail from a larger picture depicting some of the first generation of post-war black children in Lambeth, formerly from a collection of original works of art held by the Nottinghamshire Education Committee's Teaching Aid Service, end quote. The imagery, technique, and handling of dry paint calls to mind works by fellow Berliner, emigre Eva Frankfurter, born in the same year as Maya, depicting the Windrush generation employed by Lyons Corner House and such like, in London in the 1950s and their children. Early in February 1958, Maya's work was also included in the Pictures for School exhibition, an exhibition shown almost annually between 1947 and 62, the Chronicle infused. There is no more cheerful atmosphere than the Whitechapel Art Gallery when the Pictures for Schools exhibition is on show. The children who come in parties to vote for a new picture to be hung in their school convey their enthusiasm more emphatically than most Bond Street collectors, and there is plenty to attract them, end quote. Emigres including Fred Ullman, Margaret Marx, Dolph Reiser, Klaus Meyer, Helena Korn, Georg Ehrlich, and Meyer were listed amongst the exhibitors. During the 1950s and early 60s, Maya was bringing up her children, taking visual inspiration from their young lives. In 1968, this found wider expression in her earliest illustration-only book, Vicky, first of a small series published by the Bodley Head between 1968 and 73. Maya's distinctive haunting illustrations were complex, created by using a mix of textiles, paint, and resin, and often running items through a press. Their significance within the canon of children's book illustration is indicated by the inclusion of Maya's three image-only books in an exhibition presented in 1973 by the National Book League entitled Looking at Picture Books, which took an analytical approach to a broad range of imagery. The exhibition was conceived in the wake of the Book League's four linked displays on the theme of word and image the previous year. Curator and catalogue compiler was one Brian Alderson, children's book historian and children's book editor for The Times. He included over 200 illustrators from the historical to the contemporary with an international reach. The Hitler emigres were represented by Maya and the Poles, Jan Lewitt, George Him and Jan Pienkowski. Maya's three books were Vicky, Let's Play Mums and Dads and Hide and Seek. And the flyleaf for Vicky observed, I quote, this is a picture book with a difference. It is literally a picture book for there are no words at all. Renata Meyer's full color drawings tell the story of a small girl who is by herself and lonely. Through her grief comes a determination to do without human friends. She will make herself a playfellow. And it then continues, Vicky is a picture book of exceptional beauty and understanding. Her style is immediately recognizable. She makes her pictures by printing onto the paper through a variety of materials, leaves, grasses, lace, and so on. And the doll was first knitted by the artist and then used in the printing, end quote. Each image, as well as conveying often complex emotions, was characterized by a richly limited palette, flattened use of pictorial space, suggestions of different textures, and obvious detailed enjoyment of the natural world. Though the title was inspired by her own daughter's name, the portraits was, were actually based on a neighbor's child. The potted bio further stated, I quote, Renata Meyer's preferred interest is in children, her own and the species in general, but she also finds time to be a prolific painter. She's no particular medium, painting with oils, watercolor, using collage and painting on plastic, etc." end quote. 
Alderson wrote that Vicky presented Meyer's reviewers with, quote, serious problems of assessment, end quote, not only in its experimental printmaking, but also in its unusual point of view, as more than anything, quote, a pictorial exploration of the intensity of child feelings, demanding not so much to be explained as to be felt, end quote. Vicky was also praised by Sheila Harrison in The Guardian, who described Meyer as, quote, obviously a gifted and forceful artist, and I thought many of her vivid projections of a child's loneliness were psychologically disturbing. However, some critics consider both theme and style too sophisticated for children to understand, end quote. While reviewing Hide and Seek, the Times critic Eleanor von Scheinitz described Meyer as, quote, one of the avant-garde artists in contemporary children's picture books, end quote. In 1971, the story of Little Nittle and Threddle was published, both written and illustrated by Maya, the tale of a sewn girl and a knitted boy who grow up to have a child, Pearly, both knitted and sewn, and the ensuing tensions engendered by her mixed identity. Beneath these charming images lay a serious concept inspired by Maya's own difficult childhood experiences. Combining her lifelong preoccupations with childhood difference, the aging process and the natural world, Maya held a solo exhibition in spring 1975 at Benuri, where tone and content were set by a poem she had written, included without preamble on the invitation, and I'll read from the poem. Their innocence will inevitably be lost when they have played oranges and lemons, wondering whether to be an orange or a lemon or an oralem and compromise in all things, end quote. This immediately brought to mind Maya's own complex identity as a child, German, Jewish, English, or a bit of each. Focusing on childhood difficulties as mirrored by nature, both word and image in the show conveyed feelings of anxiety through references to the forms of twisted tree branches. And as the, con the Chronicle reviewed, quote, there are woods with intertwining thickets, scarcely penetrable, except by the light. This sometimes reveals distant children whose gradual loss of innocence forms the philosophic background to the series. Her understanding of children is brought out in some excellent portraits, especially a little girl with toes turned in and head lowered shyly without sentimentality." End quote. After Charles's death in 1988, Meyer established the Keeping Gallery at home in his memory exhibiting their work in their former studios and other ground floor spaces, culminating in her life story frieze presented behind glass. The gallery's website still shows Maya warmly welcoming, explaining that, quote, when Charles died, I was devastated. And the only uplifting project I could think of was to start displaying some of his original illustrations on the walls. They looked good, so I added some of my paintings and thought if we could no longer be together, at least our work could. The project kept me busy, and as the exhibition grew, people started coming to have a look, including classes of school children, and I liked showing them round." Quote. In 1982, Maya had begun creating a series of autobiographical elements, combining textiles and mixed media to form a frieze, telling the story of her refugee childhood, her difficult integration, later familial relationships, marriage, motherhood, and beyond. Maya was a member of the 62 group of progressive textile artists and her complex partially stitched images, often inspired by iconic packaging and adverts, were simultaneously presented alongside the original source material. And I'll end with some key images just to give a flavor. Renata's early childhood in England is summed up by a newspaper crossword in which stitched answers respond to autobiographical clues. 11 across, teeth. Lost teeth were posted to her grandparents abroad. 13 across, maids, refers to a succession of German staff. Two down, school reports. If these were good, the children were taken to Lyons Corner House as a treat. The birth of her younger brother, Benjamin Robert, in 1936 was represented by licorice all sorts, while naturalization in 1938 and the outbreak of war in 1939 are conveyed through the use of patriotic red, white, and blue, 
suggested by Ajax and Brillo packaging, respectively. The trauma of evacuation to the very English Cook family was inspired by a bag of frozen sweet corn. When asked what food she liked, Maya had replied, Mais, the German for corn, but which sounded like mice, and which was entirely misunderstood by her hosts, who thought she was suggesting that foreigners ate small rodents. Memories of her girls' boarding school are presented via frozen vegetables, perhaps suggesting that the girls were alike as peas in a pod, although with her Jewish identity, Maya was, of course, different. A biscuit bag inspired united prayers when the Jewish girls did not have to kneel or repeat through Jesus Christ our Lord. The text also describes how Renata's parents eventually compromised by celebrating hybrid festivals, such as Weinuka, half Hanukkah and half German Christmas, creating, quote, a great identity crisis for the family, end quote. Anxiety at her father's post-war return to the family after being demobbed is conveyed through Swiss cottage fathers based on a cookie packet. In the text, Maya recalls his wish for her to find a good Jewish husband and to dress up in heels and makeup to attract the sons of his friends and colleagues, ideas which were abhorrent to her. In later life, Charles was described as the peacock and Renata with her total disinterest in style and dressing up as the peasant. From Swiss Cottage to Harley Street conveys her father's difficult professional trajectory as an emigre doctor in private practice, facilitated by a move to premises in Upper Barclay Street, opposite the West London Synagogue. Renata notes that the practice flourished latterly with both Jewish and Arab patients and her father eventually rented rooms in Harley Street. Many Jewish refugees keen to visit a doctor to qualify for restitution money, now available from the German government. Maya herself died in 2014, but as already mentioned, she can still be seen on the Keeping Galleries website, inviting visitors into her private world, where a refugee childhood and its aftermath continues to be brought vividly to life while a blue plaque outside, matching an earlier one for Charles, now proudly confirms that Renata Meyer, artist, lived here. Thank you.